Well, it's 201. Okay. So, uh, two all right. Well, yeah, I'll just uh, get started. I'm sure most people know already, but we are the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. We've been around for 25 years today, uh, emphasis on the, the word critical. Um, there's a lot of functions that we do. We give out science fair prizes to multiple counties in, in the area for young people demonstrating critical thinking in, uh, in the area of science presentations. We also have a considerable web page presence. And during the school year, we have meetings that used to be in person, eventually will again at the Philadelphia Community College or the Community College of Philadelphia. And that's where we're based around. And we also at uh, uh, different points of the year, we have uh, an expedition and a number of different functions. We encourage people to go online at www w.phact.org to possibly become members. And we have a good presence for meetup and an email list. And we're on Twitter, Twitter and I think maybe Instagram too. Our next uh, will we'll be off for December, but the third Saturday in January will be starting up again. You'll have to see our webpage or one of our different news feeds to get uh, that speaker. I'm still working on lining that up. So in the world, every different group that exists does well if they prune off or at least limit the influence of bad members of their own. And certainly in science, science is too important not to have this. And this is the first speaker that we've had who's really taken it upon themselves to do this job of self-policing science. And it's a really important thing. Our speaker today had uh, worked as a microbiologist in California for quite some time doing microbiome research and uh, will tell us about how she shifted over to really do a great service for science by uh, helping keep everyone honest who publishes. So uh, I'd have you, this is the point where if we were in person, we'd uh, give a big applause uh, for our speaker, Elizabeth Bick. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Eric. And, and thank you for having me here today, if only virtually. So I'm in California right now. I'm originally from the Netherlands. I'll give a little bit of background uh, about myself while I will um, uh, share my screen in a second. So um, I'm originally from the Netherlands, trained as a microbiologist. I moved to the United States uh, 20 years ago and worked 15 years at Stanford. Uh, like Eric said, I worked on the microbiome of humans and of dolphins, which was a really, really wonderful time. Then I worked two years in industry uh, the company that I worked at was called Ubiome, and um, its founders are currently being charged with insurance fraud. So that company did not end well and might be the next Theranos. I, I don't know if there will be a, uh, a case, a legal case, but it was an interesting period. Um, I uh, was not involved in the fraud, just want to make sure <laughs> that uh, I state that. Um, but during my time at Stanford, I uh, got interested in science integrity. So what I do is I'll look at science papers and I'll find duplications or other problems in them. Um, so I, I'll scan science papers and I'll uh, report them. And of course, the work that I do doesn't give me a lot of friends. I do make a lot of enemies because I'm criticizing other scientists' work. So I'm currently working as a consultant and I, um, uh, I, I run two blogs. And let me share my screen so it's a little bit easier to to know, I hope you can see my screen while that is building up. So I have a blog called Science Integrity Digest. That's the blog I will post some of these cases that I found. So may, mainly I'm looking at uh, science misconduct cases uh, or at least suspected science misconduct. And I will um, post them there. Uh, I still run uh, uh, the blog called Microbiome Digest. That is sort of my for my microbiome days, uh, but that's currently run actually by volunteers. So I set it up, but it's currently run by uh, by um, a team. 
And I am on Twitter, so my handle is microbiome without an E here, digest because Twitter doesn't has a limited number of uh, letters. So uh, before um, I, I start to show some examples of the work that I do, I do want to disclose my conflicts of interest because sometimes I will criticize other scientists for not disclosing them. So I, of course, need to make sure I have that uh, properly done. So I um, am a consultant. I uh, get asked by universities or scientific publishers to, let, to look at cases of suspected misconduct. Uh, sometimes there's lawyers um, involved as well. So that's sort of how I make my money. I do get speakers honoraria uh, by universities and scientific publishers to give talks. Um, I am still on four U-Biome patents, but like I said, the, the founders are being charged with fraud. So that's not bringing in any money uh, and probably never will. And I have a Patreon account where people can support my work because I don't have a regular salary, um, uh, but people want to contribute and, and want to support me. Um, they sometimes donate small amounts of money every month. And I don't say that to ask you for money. Um, I have a lot of support, so I'm, I'm really, really happy with that. But I do say it as a disclosure that I'm being paid um, to, um, for, for the work that I do. But it doesn't come with any conditions. I can work. I have the freedom to work on the things that I think are important, the scientific papers or topics that I think are important to look at. So the work that I do also um, is, is done by, by several other people. There's other people who uh, might still work in science and academia uh, and do this work as a hobby. Some others do it uh, full time. So there's, there's lots of people are, who are searching for errors, concerns, um, things like plagiarism or uh, image duplication or just methodology that can be wrong in scientific papers. So I'm mentioning a couple of people here, people I've worked with. Um, a lot of these interactions are on Twitter, actually. And so we have sometimes uh, chats with each other. But most of us work, even though we, 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 we um, coordinate some work with each other, most of us work on, on themselves. Like I work on my, on my own. But these are people doing very similar work. And I want to give them credit for uh, everything they do. I'm one of the more the people who is more in the open. So sometimes I get credit for work that they have done. So I want to make sure uh, everybody's credited here. So why do all of us care about scientific papers and what is in them? Because you would argue scientific papers have been peer reviewed, right? There shouldn't be any errors left. Well, that's not true. There are still plenty of errors and plenty actually fraud left in scientific papers. And we care about these things because I see scientific papers publications as the building blocks of science. When we as a scientist form a new hypothesis or when we start our research, we will look at previously published papers and we'll, we'll see what others have done and we will build our work on those papers. So scientific papers are for scientists the way of communication. We leave a legacy. Whenever we do research, we build upon the work of others. So scientific papers I see sort of as bricks in a wall. And if one of those bricks is, is wrong, so maybe a scientific paper can have an error or can even contain fraudulent data, that means that the other bricks that are resting on that brick are not on stable ground. And so other scientists might waste a lot of time and money and uh, yeah, grant, uh, grant money and, and, and effort trying to replicate those results. But maybe they never happened. Maybe there's a big error in these papers or there is fraudulent data. So I feel that even if a science paper has been peer reviewed and made its way into the scientific literature, we should still be able to criticize these papers. And if we find an error in them, there needs to be a correction or maybe even a retraction to sort of preserve science integrity. Now, it's easy to listen to my talk and think that all scientists are fraudulent. And I want to make sure that that's not what I think. I know that most scientists are very honest and, and science is about finding the truth, right? It's, that's what it should be. But science is also not immune to fraud. There is fraud in science, um, but it's not, I don't, wanna, I don't want you to think that all science is fraudulent because I'm a firm believer of science. And uh, I just think that we need to make sure that science remains as good as it can be. So in the United States, there's the Office of Research Integrity, ORI, 
And they define science misconduct as one of three things, plagiarism, falsification, and fabrication. Now, plagiarism, uh, I think most people will sort of know what it is. That's, it's usually stealing somebody else's text or ideas without putting it between quotes, without citing uh, or referring to the previous person who wrote that text. So without giving credit, just stealing a sentence and passing it off as their own. And I actually worked in this field. This is how I got interested in it. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about that today. I specialize more in falsification and fabrication. Now, falsification is where a person does an experiment, obtains some data and some numbers, but then leaves out that one outlier that doesn't quite fit in their hypothesis or uh, they will maybe change some numbers. So they get a little bit higher, so they, they pass a threshold suddenly and a, and a sample suddenly is positive. That will be falsification. So changing data that you have obtained. Fabrication is where data is completely made up. Somebody sits at their kitchen table, that's usually how I sort of picture it, types in some numbers in Excel and makes a nice graph without actually doing an experiment completely making up data. And that is actually, that happens. And, and, and that is called fabrication. So those three are the sort of the pillars of science misconduct, the, the three things that would be in the United States considered science misconduct. Um, I also want to point out that I usually make my talk, I don't want to make it too much about the persons doing misconduct. It's very easy and sensational to, to talk about these cases and to call people a fraud. Uh, but that's not really how I can do my work, because if I do that, I would be involved in a lot of legal cases. So, and I'm also very well aware that a lot of people who do misconduct might not really do it just because they think it's fun to, to cheat. They might do it because they are in a situation where we all have to publish. All, science, science, uh, science, uh, uh, all scientists need to publish in order to to keep their job in order to make their careers. And we do focus too much on publications, I feel, as an output. But in this publish or perish culture, you can see that people are, are driven to do uh, misconduct because it will, if the results are not as they get hoped, they, they, they want to change that and they um, then might suddenly get a good uh, result. But there's usually a sad story behind it. So I want to be respectful. Um, uh, still going to, to, to find these papers and report them, but I don't want it to, I don't want to make fun of people because you never know who did really the misconduct. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's just, it, there's just human sadness behind the scenes. So there can be all kinds of problems in scientific papers, if you think about it. And a lot of these problems are like study setups or, or errors, picking the wrong statistical methods, and, and some of these are, are not really, they're not misconduct. They're just uh, bad research practices, but not necessarily misconduct. But there's a lot of gray zone. So on one hand, you might have the perfect scientific paper without any errors, perfectly executed. That's very rare. And on the other hand, you could have, you could think of a paper that's completely falsified or fabricated. And, but there's, there's a lot of gray zone in the middle where people just think they do a good statistical test but somebody else will point out that that was not the right test and that might change the result. Or somebody picked a control group and didn't quite think about how to do this well. And so there could be problems with that. Somebody could have all kinds of conflicts of interest and not disclose that. And, and that's definitely bad, but is it misconduct? Uh, maybe they just forgot it. That could happen. Uh, there could be issues with human ethical research, like not obtaining the right permits, for example. Um, that's definitely bad, but you can sort of see that there's, there's just a lot of gray uh, in between, and you cannot just yell misconduct. Sometimes these are errors or wrong decisions, but not necessarily misconduct. I specialize in um, duplicated or altered photographic images. So I, I have some examples here. Usually I will mark them with colored boxes to point out that they have duplications in them. And very often this could be errors, uh, but there's also cases of where a photo has been manipulated in such a way that it appears to be misconduct. And that is sort of what I do. And so when you think about photographic images, uh, these are obviously not from science papers, but it's, easily, it's easy to fool you 
um, with a photo that has been photoshopped. So all the photos here have been photoshopped and they, they want to tell you a story. And since we humans tend to believe our eyes a lot, right? You see it, you believe it. A photo or it didn't happen. We love photos and we love uh, visual information as proof that something has happened. But of course, with Photoshop being so easily available now and becoming really, really good, we tend to look at these photos and think they really happened. Um, and I cannot really look at these photos and recognize they have been photoshopped. Um, but uh, we, uh, what I can recognize are duplications. So there are duplications in two of these photos that I might be able to recognize. I wasn't involved in debunking any of these photos, but um, I, I didn't mark this, but um, this photo has duplications. So actually, instead of uh, all four rockets uh, or missiles going off, only uh, three went off. And there's some duplication uh, in this photo to make it look like all four missiles went uh, off successfully. And there's parts that of this photo that have been duplicated and people recognize that and pointed that out. And in this part, uh, I didn't mark that, but parts of these, uh, whatever, hovercraft thingies landing on the beach have been duplicated as well. So instead of uh, maybe just one uh, was landing and, and they photoshopped it to make it look like there were many of them landing on this beach. I think it was in North Korea. I would, I might be able to recognize that. So I'm sort of looking at scientific images in, in, um, in scientific papers and recognizing duplications like these, but I would not be able to recognize a very good Photoshop like this one, uh, this the bear was put in later. And so this is not a real photo. Uh, it's a real photo, but the situation never happens. So what I do is I will look at scientific papers, look at photos, and I will uh, look at duplications. That is what I recognize. And in my work doing this, I have found three types of duplications. I call them simple duplication, category one. Category two, a duplication with repositioning. In category three, a duplication with an alteration. And going over, I, I pulled these, these examples with uh, sunsets and palm trees from Hawaii or something sort of to, to illustrate my point. So if we focus first on the category one, simple duplication, uh, this might be uh, figure one in a scientific paper and this might be figure two. And of course, scientific papers usually don't contain photos of sunsets. But this is just an example to illustrate my point. Um, but you can see that in figure one and in figure two, there's one photo marked by me with a green box. That is exactly the same photo. It's being reused maybe to represent a different experiment. Or maybe one figure will say, oh, this is, these are sunsets in, in, in Maui and these are sunsets in Oahu. But in reality, you can actually see that one of these photos is the same. So it's an inappropriate duplication to, to make it look like they're two different places or two different experiments. Um, in the category two duplication, there's a duplication here between figure one and figure two uh, with an overlap. So you can see, uh, of course, it's the same photo as this, but I, I panned it out, I zoomed in a little bit and I moved it. And so this photo and this photo have an overlap with each other. It's not just an overlap, it's also a different zoom factor. And, and this would be a duplication with a repositioning. Uh, maybe to mislead us, because it, it, you have to look carefully to see the duplication. These could also be duplications with mirroring, rotations, things like that. So those are category two duplications. In category three duplications, we're looking at duplications within a photo or alterations within a photo, like the example we saw in the previous slide with, um, uh, the, for example, the, the hovercrafts landing or the missiles going off, like parts of the photo itself have been duplicated. So that would be a category three duplication. And if you sort of zoom out then again and, and think about these three duplication categories, um, I think we can all agree that the simple duplication is the most likely to have been done by an honest error. Somebody just didn't label their photos right, pulled the wrong photo and, and used it again. Category three is the most likely to have been done intentionally. Usually things in nature don't look quite the same. So two palm trees would never look that similar. That's, that's some Photoshopping going on here. That was done intentionally. And I actually Photoshopped this myself. Um, the category true could be either way. It could be done intentionally, or maybe just people make different photos of the same scene and just use them by accident. That's hard to tell. But these three categories help me a little bit to, to, uh, yeah, to know if a paper was really done with misconduct or if these were just honest errors. 
Now, in scientific papers, uh, usually there's no photos of palm trees there's, uh, or sunsets. A photo in a scientific paper might look like this. And, and so here's some examples. And all these photos are fine. There's no Photoshopping going on here. There's no duplication. This is just an illustration of how images in a scientific paper might look like. Uh, and some, um, actually many scientific papers don't even have photos. They might just have line graphs or tables. But if they have photos, and in particular in biomedical papers, so I'm a, in, from the biomedical field, they might look like these. So there might be photos of cells or of tissues. Uh, this is some nanostructure. Uh, these are some, I don't know, viruses. And, and so you can see these photos. These are uh, blots or, or so protein bands, and these are DNA bands. And, and you can sort of look at these photos and know that all the components are unique because everything in nature is pretty much unique. Like we can tell faces apart, we can tell leaves apart. They all look similar, but they all have like slightly different uh, shapes and forms. We can tell rocks apart and we can tell these photos apart as well. I can look at these and all of these bands have a slightly different shape or a gray um, color or like thickness and there's little spots and dots. And I can look at them and see, well, these look unique to me. But of course there are also examples of duplications. So here's an example of a type one duplication that I found in a paper. And there's, uh, if you look at the labels, there's different treatments, uh, the control, and then some compounds with different concentrations. And then there's like different time points and there's different cell lines. I don't know, but like all these panels should be unique. All these panels look, should not look the same. But there's actually two panels here that uh, are identical and maybe you have spotted them. Some people are really good at this and some people are, are, are will never be good. There's no overlapping panels as far as I can tell, but these two panels here at the bottom look identical to me. They are identical and they should be, they're presented as two different experiments, so they should not be identical. And so I wrote, uh, reported this to the journal um, in October 2015 and it got fairly quickly Let's say, I don't know, could have been faster, but let's, let's not uh, make too much of a fuss about that. About a year later, this paper got corrected. The author said, oh, yeah, you're right. We used the same, the, the same photo twice. This should have been a different photo. And the paper got corrected. Now, this is not a big deal. I don't think anybody would, would completely bis be misled by this. Or, but, you know, it's, it's one of those little things that should be corrected. And, and so the authors did that. So that's great. That was a type, type one duplication. Here's another example. This is actually not a photo, obviously. Uh, and I'm not even sure what this is. This is outside of my field. This is more like physics uh, or chemistry. And uh, basically I'm looking at a lot of noise and then a big peak and then different elements. And uh, there's two of these, uh, two sets of lines, so four lines in total uh, that uh, are repeats of each other. And you can tell that because these patterns of noise are unique, you can tell them apart. And so if you, if you sort of let your eyes slide over this image, you might pick up on two, uh, two of these plots that look identical. And I've marked them here, for example, this, this black blank. If you look at the, the pattern of noise, that's exactly the same as, um, as the pattern in, in this, uh, I don't know, barium. Well, then the, the, the nickel here, this, this um, uh, uh, what is it? Um, sorry, uh, as the nickel, I, I, sorry, I say it wrong. So the blank and the nickel are the same. And then the barium and the chromium also have the same pattern. And if you look carefully, you can look at these things for a long time. Um, yeah, these appear to be the same. So we reported this to the journal and they actually, the author said, yeah, you're right. Sorry, we made a mistake and the image got quickly corrected within months actually. So that was a very fast correction. So great. Now let's move on to a type two duplication. So now here we're looking at four different photos that are presented as cells being treated with different amounts of radiation. So one set was treated with zero gray, uh, another with two gray, four gray and eight gray uh, to see what the effect would be on tumor cell migration. Um, so all these four photos should look unique. There should not be any overlap. But this is a type two duplication. There's actually overlapping uh, parts of these photos. And there's actually two of them, two sets. So these two photos overlap with each other. For example, if you look at this, this particular cell uh, group of cells, 
you can see that here. And you can also see it stretched slightly differently and zoomed out. And these two photos also overlap. And there's actually one part of the photo that, that is visible in all three. And so these two, again, like if you focus on this particular group of cells, you can see that here. And you can see that these photos, um, these four supposedly different experiments, we're actually only looking at two, where, because these three all overlap with each other. I could not find an overlap with, with number four, but maybe they're, they, they basically what they did is they moved the sample under the microscope a little bit and took another photo, but they were overlapping. But they're presented as four different experiments. Um, I personally think this was done intentionally because there was another photo with the same, uh, same type of error. But in this case, the, I reported it to the journal, uh, another plus one paper, and it got corrected about a year uh, later. Um, I think this should have been a retraction personally, because I think this has been done intentionally. There's just too many errors to ever trust this paper again. I would not trust, if people make that many errors, then why should you trust the rest of the, uh, of the paper as well? Like if a, if a doctor cuts off the wrong leg of a person, you would not want to be treated by that doctor. Like, like I think if you make so many mistakes, you, you, yeah, you would distrust the rest of the paper. But in this case, the authors got away with a correction. Here's another example. These, these are Western blots, uh, blots of proteins. So basically all these bands should look unique, um, but there's actually two pairs here that overlap with each other. In this case, we're looking at a mirroring and stretching. So I've marked them here. These two panels called bad, backs and bad, that's indeed bad because these two panels for me look the same, albeit um, flipped. So it, there's a flip and there's a slight stretch. And these two panels look exactly the same. If you would um, flip this back over, it, yeah, you would put them next to each other. They look similar to each other. They look identical to each other. But also these two gap DH panels look identical. And it's a little bit harder to see because at first glance, they look very different. But if you look carefully, you can sort of see the way that this band is a little bit higher positioned than these two bands. This particular band has a shape. It's thicker on this end and thinner on that end. And you can see exactly the same shapes here. It's just stretched in the vertical uh, direction a little bit more. So there's two overlaps. And I think these, these occasions where things are mirrored and stretched, that to me suggests that this was done intentionally. But of course, it's not up to me to investigate these things. I just have my personal opinions. So I reported this to both the Institute and the journal, but unfortunately this paper has not been addressed. We're looking um, already at uh, yeah, two years later and there's just nothing happened. And that's, that's not good for science. I feel this paper should be retracted in my opinion, but um, yeah, there's, there's no action yet from the journal. Um, now we're moving on to type three duplication. So here are two panels presented as two different experiments, colonies and soft agar. And uh, there's a duplication in the left part of this photo within the same photo. So now we're looking at one photo that has duplicated elements and you might already have spotted it. These two colonies or whatever they are, these two blobs look very similar to each other. And I usually say very similar, but I actually mean identical. That just keeps me out of trouble. And so these two, I will mark them here with my colored boxes. Um, I reported this in, to the institution in October 2017. No one replied and no action was taken. It almost seems like the, that institution, a university somewhere, the university didn't care. They're like, eh, we, we pretend we didn't see this. And uh, yeah, that, I'm disappointed by that. You would hope that science is self-correcting, that if I would report these things, and, and this is a type three duplication. So this is, in my opinion, very likely to have been done with the intention to mislead the reader, to make it look like there's more colonies in this photo than there actually were. But the institution didn't seem to care and there was no action taken. This paper is still out there and it has not been corrected or retracted. Here's another type three duplication. And this is, sort of close to my heart because this comes from the doctor who claimed that um, hydroxychloroquine was, um, was working as a medication against COVID-19. And in March last year, when the epidemic just started and, and everybody was, was, uh, had no idea how to treat it or how the virus 
was transmitted, uh, this professor came and said hydroxychloroquine is, is going to be the lifesaver. It was even that that science paper was even tweeted by uh, President Trump at that time. And I think that was the, the, the first and the last time that he tweeted about science. Um, but, but yeah, that paper had a lot of problems. I looked further into other papers by that same professor in France, and I found this particular beauty. And this is a Southern blot. Um, it's, an, it's an older paper, but it was cited by 116 others. People have based their research based on this particular paper and this particular figure. And the longer you look, you look at this figure, the more re repetitions you might see. At first glance, these all look like different bands and different smears. But if you look carefully, there's actually quite some parts of this photo that appear to be visible multiple times. And I've marked them with colored boxes. But this paper is still out there. It's being cited still. And yeah, nobody's taking action. So it's frustrating to see that. And actually, this professor, because I sort of started posting these papers online, he, is, uh, he threatened to sue me. He said, uh, you are a witch hunter and you are just a girl, but I'm going to sue you because you're harassing me with all these comments on my paper. I don't think that's harassment. I mean, I'm being a scientist asking critical questions. He didn't agree. So he, he filed a complaint with the procureur in, in Marseille. And uh, so far, I haven't heard anything. I think it's just a glorified police report. But he's been threatening me with this lawsuit for, for more than a year now. And he has several other professors working in his institution who are harassing me online. And they, uh, they have, uh, some of these have accounts have large numbers of followers. The professor himself has 800,000 followers on Twitter. He has a huge fan base. And, um, but unfortunately for him, there are now more and more reports coming out from his own lab, even like yesterday, a new report came out where people from his own lab said, this guy is just fabricating results. He just makes up results. He's changing values to make his results look better. And I would not trust things that come out of his lab. So um, I hope that will, will uh, make him uh, be investigated. But, but so far, he's just threatening everybody left and right who dares to criticize him. And uh, I don't think that's a good way to do science. But we'll see how that ends. And uh, I... Uh, I, I'm, I'm scared, obviously, if, if this lawsuit comes through, I would financially be ruined. But I do think it's worth fighting for, for science and, and bringing up things like these, these papers that appear to be falsified or, or maybe even fabricated. I don't know if this, I don't think this experiment actually happened. Here's another example from a very different lab, but again, a type three duplication. This is a scanning electron microscopy photo, SEM. And this is one of those photos, I don't know, I'm not sure what I'm looking at, some nanoparticle structure, like it's something very tiny. And uh, under this microscope, they took this photo. But I don't know if you spotted, this photo looks almost like looking to these one, one of these kaleidoscope viewers, like everything starts to repeat. And there's just a lot of repeats here. I've marked some of them, not even all. Um, this paper I've reported, you would think, in my opinion, this is a five second retraction. You look at this photo and you're like, yeah, no, that's, that did not really happen, this experiment. Somebody photoshopped here, left and right, and up and down. So I reported this to the journal in September 2019, and they didn't take any action. They're like, no, eh, it's fine. And, and, and so that's frustrating. Why didn't, they, why didn't the journal immediately retract this paper? I'm waiting for this for two years and nothing happens. And sometimes I write to them and they don't even respond to them. So science is not as self-correcting as you might hope. So I did a lot of these uh, searches for, for papers. Uh, and I started doing this while I still worked at Stanford. And I searched for, uh, I searched actually 20,000 papers um, by eye, all biomedical papers. They all had to have at least one photographic image. And if I looked for these papers, I found 800 in that set of 20,000 to contain duplications like the ones I've shown you in the previous slides. And so I found these three types of duplications. And if we assume that the simple ones are all honest errors and that the altered one, the, the type three duplications are always done intentionally, are always science misconduct. And if we assume that this middle portion, let's say roughly half is intentional and half is, uh, is maybe an honest error, then and, and also knowing that these 
800 pips were roughly equally distributed over these three categories. We made our best guess um, about uh, saying that about 2% of papers might that of, of those 20,000 20, papers, 2% appear to have done uh, these duplications intentionally. So that might mean that 2% of, of all papers are science misconduct. But I don't think that's the case. There's a, uh, it's easy for me to look at photos and to know that there are uh, duplications in them. But if you think about line graphs or tables, there might actually be much more misconduct. I would not be able to recognize if somebody really made up a convincing graph. I would not be able to know that that was my misconduct. I can only really catch the, the tip of the iceberg, the dumb fraudsters uh, that leave traces for me to find. Somebody who couldn't do a really convincing Photoshop or somebody who couldn't just make up some nice graph, they would fool me. And, and nobody would know that that data was made up. So I think that the real percentage of misconduct might be in the five to 10% range. And that is actually a scarily high number if you think about that, that 10% of papers, up to 10% of papers might contain uh, intentionally misleading data. Uh, it also might mean that 90% of papers are good. I think you can look from it from both sides. And I still believe firmly in science, like I said before, but it is a scary number. So I, uh, when I normally um, find these papers, I will report them to the editor-in-chief of the journal or the research integrity officer of the university where that person has had worked. And they might or they might not do an investigation. And in that set of 800 papers that I reported five or six years ago, 65% of these papers were not acted on after me waiting five years. So the majority of these papers with these errors or, or even fraud are not corrected or retracted by the editors. And that's, that's bad. That's, that's like, I, I find, I try to find good stuff. I try not to accuse anybody. And yet the editors are not taking any action. It's like you bring your car back to the, to the dealer because a wheel fell off. And then the dealer's like, no, you just sold, I sold you the car. I'm not going to take it back. I'm not going to repair it for you. No, you're on your own. Like we would not accept that. We, I feel we pay so much money to the scientific publishing industry. They should also do some, some aftercare, some quality control. But in the majority of the cases, they don't. So I'm starting to post these these papers with these errors on puppeer.com, which is a website where you can discuss papers. And you can also install a plugin. And if you do that, you can actually do a literature search and you can see these green banners that a paper has a comment on Puppeer. And you can click on that and see what comments people left on that paper. So it's post publication peer review. And I feel that's the only way I can share my concerns about these papers with the rest of the world, sort of warning other people, if you're going to base your new research on this paper, be aware that there's a big error in figure five, and, and, uh, or even worse. And so we can discuss these papers on this website up here. I sometimes also post on Twitter and discuss these papers there. Um, let's see, uh, I have a little bit of time left, I hope. I, I want to sort of switch topics a little bit and tell a little bit about paper mills. So paper mills, so, so far I've told about what I think are individual cases, like one rogue researcher feeling the need to falsify data and publishing that. But there are also organized crime type of fake papers out there that are pumped out by, by uh, maybe universities uh, and, um, and they sell these papers to authors who need them. Now, we all need to publish papers as a scientist, but there's a particular requirement uh, that is, is almost impossible for, for researchers or for doctors in this case to do. So in China, there's a requirement that if you are a medical doctor and you have finished medical school and you want to work in a hospital, um, you have to publish a scientific paper. And this is when you think about it, a very strange requirement because these are doctors, not researchers. Um, maybe some of them are interested in research, but most of these people just want to help patients. They want to work in a hospital. They want to do what they have been trained to do. But yet they have to publish a paper. Otherwise they cannot get that position. They cannot get a promotion. They cannot continue in their career. So it's an impossible requirement. 
they're also not given time to do research and who can do research in their free time that usually when you are a doctor and you work 80 hour week shifts or so, you probably don't have time to do research. Um, they might even not work in a hospital that has a research facility. So these people make need papers. And of course, then other people will sell papers and, and they will sell these fake papers to authors who need them. They're sold for pretty high amounts of money. Uh, $5,000 would already be expensive here in the US. In China, that's even more. That's almost like could be a yearly salary or so. So they're very expensive. But these people need them and they see it as an investment and they often will, fight, will buy a paper with multiple authors to share the cost. These papers are we believe are completely fake, but they look real. They look actually very real, and uh, but they're being massively pro produced and they sort of are very similar to each other, but they have enough differences to fly under the plagiarism detection radar. And I have worked, I was one of the persons, but I have to credit many others, um, Jennifer Byrne, Jana Christopher, uh, and uh, pseudonyms, Smut Clyde, Morty, and uh, Tiger, um, who have all worked on this uh, paper mill as well. And we found a set of papers that we believe are like six, 700 papers um, and maybe even more that all have a very similar title. And here are a couple of examples. So these six titles are from completely different papers, completely different authors, no overlap at all. You might see that they sort of follow this pattern. We came up with this sort of bingo uh, generator title generator uh, joke. It's, it's sort of a joke, but it, it appears that these, these titles are, are sort of generated. Um, the papers do make sense. They're not like side gen papers. They do make sense if you read them and they actually look pretty real. They have, they have images, they have graphs and they have photos. And so if you look at the photos from this paper here on the left and compare it to the photos from this paper here on the right. And again, these are two different papers, two different journals, two different publishers, two different sets of authors, no overlap. And the papers look not exactly identical. They're sort of a similar style. But if you look carefully at these Western blots and, and, and compare them to each other um, and, and sort of enhance the background a little bit, you start to see that all these panels have had the same background. And actually the background of these panels and these panels is very similar. I mean, there's different compression factor, but there's this little, there's a vertical line that we recognize that all of them had. And basically it looks like all of these images are very similar there. We think they're computer generated, but they, they made the mistake of all using the same background, which is how we caught them. So we call this the tadpole paper mill. And so far we've identified 600 papers and they're, they're being retracted. So luckily in this case, the, the publishers agree with us. They actually will write to the authors and the authors will not even defend their paper. They will say, oh, just retract it. They don't care because they got their position they got their promotion and they don't care about the paper at all. So here's two other papers that have a similar problem. This is a, another paper mill, another group of papers. So I've identified 125 papers in total. Again, two different papers. Um, they, these were uh, published in the same journal. Um, they're both about prostate cancer, uh, but there are uh, different authors and, and so, but they are similar enough to, to maybe raise some concerns. And if you look at this particular photo and this particular photo and, and look at them in more detail, here they are from the left paper or from the right paper. Again, at first glance, these look different, but if you zoom in and, and, and pay attention, you might notice this, this structure here. This is, looks like the letter J and you can see the same structure here, but it's upside down. So this is where I spend a lot of time on looking at these images and recognizing that these are two images that were that have the same origin. It's the same. It looks like two different photos of, of the same uh, specimen, but they're used to represent very different experiments. So again, this, this appears to be a set of stock photos that was used over and over again in, in at least 125 papers. And these are also being retracted right now. And here's another example. This is a third paper mill that we found and these paper mills all had the same graph. And it's not exactly identical. There's dots removed and dots added, but you sort of might recognize this, this upside down Y um, that you can see in all four graphs. And these are presented as very different experiments. If you look at the labels, they actually, they look very different. But if you have some memory of these graphs, you can actually 
start to see that these graphs are very similar to each other. And then you might see a problem in this table. This is from the same comb paper mill. We found this set of papers. Uh, they were all about different types of cancer. So one, ca one paper might be about prostate cancer, like this one here, or it might be about colon cancer or breast cancer or cervical cancer, any cancer you can think of. Um, was included in this paper mill. And they all had a very similar table like this one, but the numbers were different. But here they made, with this particular paper, they actually made a big mistake. So if you look at the gender of the patients, you would not expect half of your uh, prostate cancers to be uh, patients to be female. That would be very unusual. And if you would be really a prostate cancer researcher, you would not make this mistake. Or... If you would have found that, that would be so remarkable that you would have devoted some sentences on that. But they basically, you can see here that the, the paper mill group who, who produced this paper, uh, when they switched maybe from colon cancer to prostate cancer, they forgot to remove one line. And so it's errors like this that they have made that we can catch them. But otherwise, these papers would look very, very realistic. So that brings me to my, my last slide. And I have some discussion points here. Uh, I don't have always the answers, but I did touch a little bit on what I think is the percentage of misconduct. So I think it's, it's if you just think about all scientific papers ever that have ever been published, the intentional misleading data is probably present in five to 10% of papers. That's my best guess. And, um, but it's sometimes hard to recognize things, these things. There have been papers retracted uh, because they contain fake da data, and I would have never been able to guess that just looking at the paper itself. Most of these papers look fine uh, from the outside. They can look nice and shiny, but they can com be completely rotten from the inside, and it's just hard to, to recognize that. I only recognize the tip of the iceberg. Why do people commit misconduct? Because we, we expect them to publish great papers, and in science, um, an experiment doesn't always work out. And it's very hard to publish a negative result. If you have done five years of research and you're the drug that you investigated that you would hope would solve Alzheimer's or something else, and it doesn't work, it's very, it's very tough to publish that. Uh, most journals only want to look at uh, very attractive or very uh, positive results, and they might not accept that. So you can see that people might be tempted to change the result to make them look better. Or you might work in a lab where the professor is a bully and the professor expects you to produce that result by Friday. And you are very afraid of this professor because he or she is in a position of power and can decide whether or not you as a graduate student might leave the lab with a PhD in your hand or that you might be fired. And if you're a graduate student or a postdoc on a visa in the United States, and your sponsor, your, your university uh, fires you, that means you have to pack your bags and move with your family back to the country where you came from within days often. So you can see that people can almost be held hostage in situations like that. And there are labs where all the postdocs come from foreign countries on visa, and they're, they're sort of afraid that they, they will lose their job. And you can, you can, almost have sympathy that these people start to do misconduct just to get nice, shiny, positive results and make the professor happy. So in that situation, that, that is sort of a, uh, yeah, a very an situation where you easily can get these, uh, these labs that produce massive amounts of <laughs> mis papers that contain misconduct. Um, I did touch a little bit about the conflicts of interest. It seems that a lot of publishers are not really willing to look at these papers. Uh, and they might not do because the paper brings in citations and basically papers bring in money. So if a gap paper gets cited, the citation index of that journal goes up and other people will want to publish in that journal as well. It's, it's considered to be a good journal. Uh, and so if uh, journals are sometimes afraid to retract or act on these papers because they rake in citations, they bring in money and they just don't want to investigate or they maybe the one of the authors is actually on the editorial board of the of the journal and i've seen this many times they usually get away with small corrections even for photoshop images and that just makes me angry because it seems that these publishers are more care they care more about money than about the quality of the science papers that they publish 
and institutions don't want to investigate because maybe this is a star professor who brings in lots of grant money. They don't want to investigate him or her. And so there's all these conflicts of interest that I have learned exist. And so I'm here as a rogue investigator who's not even employed. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm discovering all these things. Uh, but I don't think this work that I'd be doing, that I do, is should be a volunteer or like sponsored through Patreon type of job. It should almost be, it should, quality control should be part of publishers and institutions themselves. And they should care about that. I also hope there will be legal protection for whistleblowers like me. I currently have two threats of, of lawsuits. They haven't solidified yet, but it is scary work. And you have to really uh, be strong and find my motivation to, to keep on doing this work. Um, and, and in the end, there's also a tremendous cost for science misconduct because uh, not just for scientists trying to replicate those results, but also for science as a whole. We have seen in the past one and a half year, a lot of misinformation being uh, brought out as facts. A lot of people who are not longer uh, putting their trust in science. And we've seen, so all these cases of science misconduct that come out might actually amplify that message, might lead people to believe that we cannot trust any science. And again, I don't want that to be the message of my talk. I hope you agree with me. There are people fighting for good science. And, and don't think that all science is fraudulent. I'm really looking at, at science fraud. Obviously, that's what this talk is about. But I still firmly believe in science. And I feel science is the only way out of pandemics, uh, is the only way we can find answers to combat climate change. We need to believe in science. And we need to make sure that science is, is good. And, and, and that's the only way we can proceed. So with that, if you enjoy the, the duplications, I do play a game on Twitter called Image Forensics. So if you focus on this hashtag, you'll see lots of puzzles. And if, you, if I post them and the first person uh, showing where the duplication is, they'll get an emoji award so you can win those. And with that, thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh Dr. Bick, thank you so much. We need people like you. We truly do. Um, I don't usually read comments during the Q&A, but there's a very important one here from Rob Palmer, who has been one of our speakers and a friend to our group and also writes for Skeptical Inquirer. And he pointed out um, there is an ex-naturopathic doctor named Britt Marie, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, Hermes. Have you heard of her? Dr. No, Bick. no. Well, she's I, been threatened a lot because she she trained as a naturopathic doctor. I think I think I I don't recognize the name, but I think I know the story. Like she, yeah. she has sort of left the field and is now actively against. Yes, it, right. Yes, yes. And she has been threatened with lawsuits, and she she was unsuccessfully sued. But as you point out, you still have to defend it. Yeah. And Rob said the skeptical community came to the financial aid of Brit and the fund was not all spent. Now this wow. is easy for us to say, but I believe it would be used to defend, and I'm, I'm saying, I'm reading Rob's words here. I believe it would be used to defend future skeptics being legally challenged. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought when you were talking about it, I thought GoFundMe and the skeptic community and the honest science community. Um, anybody can sue anyone, but yes, uh, that, that guy, whoever's threatening you, they're going to have to pay their attorneys first right. before they get anywhere. So um, please. Well, but, but they pull the money out of the institution. So he, he's been criticized for that. Like he uses the money from, from his grants in his institution mm -hmm. to file these complaints. And, yeah. and it's not his personal money. He's using his institution's money. Uh, but but I'm, I'm pretty sure if I would be sued because I have such a large following on Twitter and such a lot of supporters, mm -hmm. I'm super grateful for that. I'm sure I would, I would get funded. Like people would would pour in money. I, I yeah. they already they. I've had several offers already. Like if you are sued, I'm gonna pay your legal cost and and Good. please yeah. So I think it's important to do, to do this work also with with a lot of supporters because um, yeah. There, there were there were I mean there were two articles in Science and in Nature on the same day. <laughs> talking about my supporters I'm like I made it to these two journals on the same day that's I think <laughs> I was very proud yeah. of that but yeah there were lots of supporters that was not financial it was just a letter of support yeah. but still 
people put in effort to support my work. Yes. And and that's that's is what keeps me going. Yes. Absolutely. Um, honest scientists are not going to fear you. <laughs> no, no, not very true. You. So um, looking at some of those pictures, ay, 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 it, it gives me a headache. <laughs> Even when you pointed it out, I couldn't really see it all that well. So um, there were a couple questions here about, um, you know, there's, there's no substitution for human intelligence I guess, but there were a couple different questions about, is there software that would make this easier? So I'll, I mean, you understand the question. I see you yes. nodding. Yes, yes, no. And, and I get this question so much. So I, I turned this into a drinking game on Twitter. So every time anybody <laughs> asks this question, I will give the answer, drink, exclamation mark, leaving the person who asked the question in total confusion, I'm sure. But it's sort of an inside joke that I have on Twitter. So it's just water, but. That's there great. we go. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get this question. So can computers do what I do? And the answer is yes, but not yet. They, uh, I have tested one software. I'm currently testing one software called Image Twin. And it actually has helped me a lot in finding when, when you have these panels with lots of uh, these figures with lots of different panels and there's overlaps here and there between them. It's super fast and I will find them with much better and much faster than I could ever do. So that's very helpful. It also sometimes completely misses two panels that are clearly the same and it just doesn't see it. And it's weird. Um, and it also has a lot of false positive where sometimes you have, and this gets technical and complicated. Sometimes there are panels that are supposed to look similar. So we'll flag those and that, that uh, those I wouldn't uh, use. You always need to have a human uh, go, over, go over the results. But it's not good enough to detect Western blots. So Western blots are apparently too, too tiny. The differences are really small. So there are people developing software. And I'm sure within one or two years, this, is, this problem has been solved. But, uh, and then publishers will use it. And somebody will make lots of money on the work, basically, that I started. <laughs> and I helped all of these software developers with my data set. And they never shared the result back with me. So I haven't <laughs> tested most of these uh, softwares. Interesting. Um, how do you decide which articles to select? It's it. Uh, I get a lot of leads. Um, so I did this initial set of 800. So I scanned these 20,000 papers that I talked about. From that set, from those 800 papers that I found, I still have 800 leads. Like every paper I can check, other papers written by the same author um, or the same first author or the same last. Those are usually the most important people I follow. Or, this, or a particular topic or a particular university. So I have lots of leads from just that one set alone. Uh, but I also get lots of leads from people where they say, like, like in the case of the, the professor from France, uh, I just read that, that one of his papers had some fishy photos. So I'm like, oh, I'll just investigate more photos, more papers by this person. And you find, start to find problems. So, uh, other people have leads, people send me emails, anonymous emails, check out the work by Dr. XYZ, uh, and I will follow up on that or check this particular paper. So lots of more leads every day than I can possibly follow. I can imagine. Um, wow. You talked about all the reasons a research center or a university might not want to address this issue. And if you already addressed what I'm about to ask, I, I apologize. There's so much information in your talk. I'm trying to keep it all up in my head. Um, are there any simple actions that universities and research institutions could set up to prevent this? I'm sure there are very complicated ones. Are there any simple ones? Um, I mean, people, uh, universities in the United States already give training to um, people like early career people. So usually graduate students, they get training in, in research misconduct. Um, I personally think that a lot of the training should also go to professors, not just focus on students, because pro professors are the one who, who create the atmosphere in the lab and they can create an atmosphere of bullying. They can create an atmosphere of honesty and like talking about, yeah, the decisions, because as a researcher, sometimes you're not quite sure, is this misconduct? Should I, can I do this? Can I leave out this outlier? Can I repeat the experiment or not? So these are the important discussions to have. I've heard people say that all outgoing papers should be scanned for image duplication. Um, 
And yeah, that's just a quality control. I feel like any researcher will pass their manuscript through a spell checker. Like you can, you can just give it to somebody else. I can see these things usually in, in, in seconds. So uh, just find somebody who has the same talent and, and, and make sure that those errors are not in your paper. Uh, I don't think we can prevent misconduct at all. Um, we can make it harder, but it, people are always going to fraud. You just can put up some, some barriers to try to prevent it. But if people want to fraud, it's very easy actually to fraud in the lab, to do fraud in the lab and not be detected ever. So scary. That's a bit pessimistic. <laughs> scary. Yes. yes. Scary. And I, I haven't focused a lot on this in my life at all, but I remember, and it's probably decades ago, somebody in the lab somewhere was actually, he was, he or she was actually experimenting with mice and was actually sewing black patches of fur on white mice and white patches of fur on black mice. This sounds like a bad cartoon. Do you remember that at all? Yeah, and I think it was actually, they, they had a marker, right? They just, they just- It might have uh, been that, yes. Yeah, I think it was- Sharpie. Looking, it was, yeah, Sharpie. I think it was like graft versus host, like to see if you can yes. transplant patches from one line of mice, like genetically different mice and that it yes. would not be rejected, but they actually in the end, so they use the, the different skin color so it would be easy visible. Uh, but they, yeah, they use the Sharpie. No, I've heard of that. I mean, there's there's many cases and some of these are, are funny actually when you read about that. Um, but yeah, some are also very, very sad. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all sad. And some of them are so obvious. You, you have to think, what were you thinking? I mean, my my parents convinced my siblings and I that if we ever told a lie, they would figure it out. And they always did. And that's a lesson that's with me to this day. Her parents have that magic ability, right? Like, <laughs> and teachers too, yeah. No, no point. Um, have any of, what penalties have you seen for? Uh, misconduct, yeah. I mean, uh, I think I'm quoting here Ivan Orensky from Retraction Watch, who said the penalty for misconduct is a, a beautiful and long career. Uh, because there seems to be very, very few penalties. And, and it makes me mad to see, uh, I've seen an author with like uh, dozens of papers flagged on papier for, for um, problems, but he was also in the editorial board of some of these journals or even the editor-in-chief. He gets away with small corrections. Um, in this particular case, he left the university, wasn't even fired, but there's many cases where these people keep on doing what they do. And maybe they, they make fewer mistakes so they don't get caught anymore, but they, they keep on receiving grants. They, yeah, there's very little punishment uh, because I think universities want to, to put this under the rug and, and not, not make it public. Um, so it's, there's a lot of similarities to the Me Too movement, like sexual harassment, mm -hmm. where in academia, it's, it's, you know, it, I think it's called like, like the moving professor. So I, I forgot that there's a funny, sort of funny, it's not funny, but like there's, there's a name for it where these professors are sort of moved to the next university and then it starts all over and everybody sort of, sort of knows about these cases, but there's no real punishment. And I feel the only way uh, we can talk about these problems is making it public, like talking about it on social media. So I'm a big believer of social media because I feel that's the only way we can bring out to the open the things we need to change. What usually was kept behind closed doors and swept under the rug, we need to talk about these cases and we need to publicly shame, name and shame maybe people and universities and, and prevent that. But unfortunately, there's very little that, ha that happens in most cases. Who were the cold fusion guys? It's been about 30 years now and mm. I can't remember their names at all. I don't. I, I, I've heard of the case. There's so many cases. <laughs> uh, I'm oh, this, most familiar with biomedical. Magazine. Yeah, no, there, I mean, there's the, there's a lot of cases in stem cell research, the Japanese um, uh, Haruko Obokata. Oh, excuse me. Um, Some, somebody just typed it up. Pons and Fleischmann. Oh, right. Okay. 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 Um, but if, if you're not, you would not have been in this country at that time. No. And it, and it, really was a, it was a physics experiment. Right. So, um, but I, I think they're still working some. Yeah, and there's Jan Hendrik Schoen from Bell Labs. Uh, that was another case where uh, he worked at Bell Labs. Um, I think this was in the 80s or so. And, and he published 
he never did experiments apparently, but he had beautiful results and published them in Nature and Science. And he has like 50 or so retractions by now. So that finally that case got, got discovered. And, but it took insider whistleblowers, several, several of them tried to report them and the institution at first didn't believe them. And so in many of these cases, you hear uh, then the history that other people tried to report these people and they were dismissed by the u- university or the institution. There was also like in the Netherlands where I'm from, we had a, a big case, a big misconduct case, again, with 50 retractions. Uh, his name is Diederik Stapel. He was a professor in psychology and he just made up all the results. Uh, he just, yeah, that was basically, that's the, the kitchen table guy, basically. He was making up the, the, the numbers, gave the, he was, he pretended to have done research at, at uh, schools or so, or like to have done all these um, questionnaires and had all these results. And then they, he, he handed them over to his graduate students. He would say, oh, this is, these are beautiful results. But the graduate students never saw their boss going actually doing this research. So they're like, how, where, when does he do all this research? And it's so beautiful. Like, like mm-hmm. there's one group and there's the other group. It's like, and, and usually things in biology are never that clear. There's always like fuzzy mm-hmm. things. So he made up beautiful results and he was reported several times by groups of graduate students to the authorities and it was always denied. And it was like the third or so time that finally people started to investigate it. And then, yeah, it turned out that the whistleblowers were right. But all the other people were dismissed and probably very frustrated. And I, I would imagine that that if that happens to you, you would leave science. You're so disillusioned. Like I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to report it. And then, yeah, as, as a junior researcher, you will often, unfortunately, lose your job if you do that. Very frustrating. Um, somebody wants to know the answer to the Twitter puzzle. Oh, the, the one I showed in my last slide? Yes. <laughs> this okay, let, me, let me pull that up. Okay. It's still, I still don't have it here. Um, here it is. Well, it's the two left ones. So I, I can tell you how I do it. So I would see these three images. And I will rule out that this image overlaps with these two because it looks different. It has a different background color. It has a different uh, density of cells. The cells are clumped in a different way. This, this image I'll immediately rule out. I'm like, okay, if there's an overlap, it's going to be between these two. And that's where it is. And I'll, I'll look for a particular structure. So for example, I will look, can I find this particular structure that looks like sort of a semicircle with a dot? And I don't really see it. It is in there, but I don't didn't really see it. Or I might look for this particular thick cell. Do I see that here? No. But then if you look for this, this structure that looks like four or so dots in a row with something dark under it, you'll find that here too. So the overlap, basically this, this part overlaps with this part. Well, I could not do your job. <laughs> yeah, and I don't immediately see it. I, 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 is it big enough? I mean, it depends, of course, on how big everybody has it on their screen. But on Twitter, you can click on it and it will blow up on your Twitter account. And so the first person saying, oh, it's the left two, and it's like you have to, you have to say it in the right way. You, you, uh, if you just say, I see it, that doesn't count. But so I usually, if a person makes an illustration, I will reward them with, the, with an award. And if they find... Uh, a duplication I didn't see myself they'll get a crown so the crown emoji award is uh, the one I hand out very very rarely but it's it's the best <laughs> one and and the thing is like I turned this into a game but obviously it's it's very serious like I I remove enough labels that you would not know which paper this is from or which author occasionally I will post that but in most cases I try to make it a fun game but secretly I'm training everybody to see these things and, and like you said, some people will never really see it. Some people have talent for it and some people don't. Like some people can sing or whistle. I, I'm a very bad whistler. So I would never, <laughs> you know, win a whistle competition. So it's a combination of having talent and pra- practicing it. But if people see these things, 
uh, if I'm training them to, to look for them, hopefully that will make them also, when they do a peer review, they will catch these things during the peer review process. So uh, that's sort of my secret mission to train all my, my 100,000 followers uh, to become better image spotters. Your disciples. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, just, just teaching them what I do and, and, and hope, hopefully making them more aware. Because it does take maybe, let's say, when you do a peer review, it's usually, for me, when I do a good peer review, I think it's like four or five hours of work. So why not spend a couple of seconds extra to, to look at the images? Sure. Sure. And we are all pattern seeking individuals. It's why yes. we see faces in tortillas and, and clouds and that's exactly, sort of exactly. Well, that's... You have, you have elevated it beyond anything that <laughs> I personally could imagine. So as I'm scrolling through here, we have a couple different types of questions about um, the difference between just very sloppy work and fraud. Uh, if somebody publishes their work in good faith and it's just done badly, or is that considered fraud? So I'll let you address that however you would like. No, so bad research practices are not fraud. So, and it's, some, it's, hard, to, it's, it's hard to draw the line. Uh, if a person is a super sloppy uh, uh, housekeeper, like doesn't label their photos very well, just has a bunch of files on a, on a desktop somewhere, uh, is that misconduct? I mean, you as a researcher, you need to be careful. So I, I'm, if you then grab the wrong photo and present it as, as a different experiment that it actually was, is that intentionally done? But it, I think it's very hard to answer that. There's, there's a lot of gray value. Uh, but um, so if you, if you just grab a statistical test and do, uh, but you have grabbed the wrong one, like you should have done, you know, test A, but you did test B. Um, and you didn't consult the statistics. I, th I think that's that's not misconduct. I wouldn't call that. But if you if you try twenty different uh, methods called p hacking, where where you just try any method and like you only show the one, all the method, all nineteen of the twenty methods tell you that it's not st statistically significant. But there's one method that actually shows it's uh, different, um, and you pick that one and present it, ignore all the other ones that might be considered misconduct because you're allowed selectively, uh, you know, cherry picking your results. Um, but it's, it's hard. You, you need to really dive into the, the lab books and, and the results to, to figure out these things. And you might never come to a conclusion. And that is why a lot of these research misconduct cases take a long, lot of time. So you just need to compare what was published with what was obtained. Um, I'm asking this one with my breath held. Are there mis have you have there been mistakes found in the Human Genome Project? Uh, I'm sure there's mistakes. There's mistakes in any big project. There's mistakes. Like every one of us makes mistakes. So I'm sure there are mistakes. Uh, whether or not these are are intentionally done, um, I don't know. I, I I think in general the Human Genome Project has not brought us the revolution that everybody sort of anticipated. Yes, we know a lot more genes and we can recognize more DNA sequences. We still don't really know how, what much of these genes do or, or, or all the, the sequences in between. Are they important or not? I mean, we're learning about that, but uh, yeah, I'm sure there's mis little mistakes where you call it the one gene, but it has to be the other. And we, um, I, I think any paper has mistakes but they're usually not super important. Okay. Here's a question that has a word I do not know. So <laughs> is, it, is it possible to recognize dissimulation of data? I would not really know what that means. Maybe. Okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to, but I'm, you know, I'm not a native English speaker, so I'm sometimes baffled by words. <laughs> like, why do I need to look them up <laughs> or I completely mispronounce them. That's uh Oh, come so no, I. Uh, that, that's no, a, I'm that's not sure mistake. what the question means. So either that person needs to try again, possibly, or and I'm I'm going to mention um, there are a couple very very long questions on here, and a very very long question to those of you who type them in is um, it, it's very difficult in a format like this where I'm reading the question and then we have a non non native English speaker person trying to make sense of about eight 
sentences. So I apologize for skipping over those and I'm reading the most concise ones. Um, and uh, quite honestly, even somebody who was raised in this country and spoke English all their life, some of these very, very long questions are a challenge in this format. Not that they're bad questions, they're just a challenge in this format. So I apologize to those people. Um, here's a short one. Have you, can you detect or have you seen airbrushing in photographs? I guess that's, um, you're nodding, so you understand the question. Yeah, so that would be, like you can imagine that, uh, so yes, the answer is yes. So airbrushing is like a Photoshop technique and I'm yeah. not a Photoshop. I actually don't even have Photoshop. I, I, but like you can imagine that you have uh, a nice photo, but there's a little smudge or smear and you basically uh, brush that like digitally on your computer. You, you might, so I'm not really sure if I say this right, but like you, you sort of like make it more fuzzy. So it doesn't really look like there's a hair on your photo. Like you, you sort of Photoshop that away you make it more look more pretty, you know, like people airbrush faces in photos where, you know, if you look at these photos of models or, or, or people like famous people, uh, and you look at the real photo and how it ended up on the cover of a magazine, that's like heavily airbrushed, like all the little irregularities on, on the faces are, are sort of stamped out there. They're sort of like made more fuzzy. So you don't see the lines and things. And so that, that happens. It's not allowed in scientific photos, but you can sort of see why it happens. Just beautification basically, uh, but it's not allowed. So I have seen it uh, and there's now stricter rules against it. I actually love to see a photo with, with, with lines and hairs and dots and spots that tells me it's a real photo, right? <laughs> I don't want to see these, these beautified things. I understand. Okay, the person who asked the dissimulation ah. question said that means to hide. So, um, and I'm I'm sorry to Mr. Gorman. I I already dismissed that question. I'm trying to to clean this out a little bit, so I'm not reading the same questions. Data is eliminated um, in order not to not confuse. Exactly. Exactly. So right. Um, I mean, yes, it, it's hard for me to detect it, but there are papers where. Uh, and and, and the, the example I'm thinking of is from the hydroxychloroquine paper that I criticized. I didn't really talk much about that, but that sort of, uh, uh, yeah, brought me a lot of uh, pushback. There, there was, uh, people were treated with hydroxychloroquine and, and one of them died. And that person actually was not included in the study anymore. I'm not sure if that answered the question. That is not good science, like to leave out <laughs> the undesired results. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, I've done, you know, a calibration curve where you make like a dilution and like, you know, you, you, you sort of expect this, this, this line with, with dots on the line. And then there was one dot that was like a complete outlier. I'm like, what did I do wrong? Maybe I pipetted something, you know, forgot to pipette this thing. So I, I just did experiment again and now it was the expected be beautiful line there. I clearly sort of left out the outlier, uh, but it's, it's it's I, I because I doubted myself. But if when you measure results and that is what you measure, uh, and you do, don't know upfront what you will measure, you should not leave out the outliers. But it's it's hard to remove outliers. When is that allowed and not? Can you redo the experiment? But can you redo the experiment? You know, hundred times and only pick the the one time that it worked. That's also yeah. not good. Exactly. So hard questions to answer. Yeah. Yeah, um, Mr. Gorman, thank you, Mr. Gorman, for your patience here. He added another comment that that is data that is eliminated in order to not confuse the conclusion, which I think is what you were just talking about. And yeah, like I said, sometimes it is okay. Like you, we had the dis discussion. If you ask 20 people what their salaries were and you have 20 people in a room, you ask them uh, over their yearly income. And, you know, you, you sort of have to have an expectation of what the average outcome would, would be. But if Elon Musk happens to be in the room and, you know, there's one outlier who has an <laughs> enormous amount of income that drives up the mean, right? Like enormously. Yes. Like, yes. is it then allowed to leave out that one outlier that sort of ruins the results? And, and, and that's a tough question to answer. I don't have an honest answer. Like I would say, well, that's what you, yeah, if you happen to have Elon Musk in that room, then that's your outcome. But basically what you should do is always have like high amounts, a high, um, a lot of measurements. And then you sort of start to see which ones might be the outliers uh, and what the, the average expected mean would be. But it's not an easy answer to question, uh, a question to answer. Yes. 
Yes, I, I understand. And it, clearly a lot of these issues are not as clear cut as we would like to think. So um, Dr. Bick, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, really interesting. We need people like you. Please keep doing what you're doing. And um, that drinking game, if you if you had come to talk to us right in Philadelphia, we would take you out afterwards yeah. and play that drinking game. <laughs> <laughs> well, here it's lunchtime, so it's, it's a little bit earlier, but uh, I, I would love that. So I'll take you up on that for maybe next time. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here. Always a pleasure to talk uh, you. You know, to people who are you know, critical thinkers. I think yes. we need more of them, many more of them, and, yes. and don't always automatically believe what you see. Oh, ask, ask critical questions. Yes. That's yes, that, that's that is point. what our, our organization is 26 years old now. And that's what we've been preaching Fantastic. since 1995. Yeah. And you, you join a long list of very um, dignified and well known and some local and not so well known, but equally fascinating speakers. So thank you very, very much. Eric, do you have anything you want to add? I, I just wanted to add? remind people to be with us. January 16th at the same time for, uh, we'll promise to get you another fine speaker then. And thank you very much, Elizabeth, for sharing your work with us and especially for doing that work and uh, helping keep science a, a little cleaner. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>